So, yeah, you've asked me to talk a little bit about um, artificial intelligence, but before we go into artificial intelligence, what I want to talk about is machine intelligence, because my research goes back into the 70s and 80s. Uh, back in uh, 1985, machine intelligence was so advanced at that point, when I was in the military, there was a, an aircraft called Puff, the Magic Dragon. It was a C-130 outfitted with computerized equipment, and you could put uh, infrared markers on soldiers. We had infrared tags on our um, equipment, on our uniforms, our helmets. And uh, the infrared tags would identify uh, targets. And then uh, you had to manually, when the aircraft was flying overhead, the uh, computer operator, the targeting uh, oper operator, would have to identify uh, as they're flying over, they would have an area about the size of a football field that could be targeted at one time. And as the aircraft's moving, the computer is tracking and keeping that um, grid coordinates, the uh, latitude and longitude of the football field size area and every square inch of that football field because the airplane's moving. You know, the wind pushes the plane left or right. There's satellite imaging, the computer's uh, keeping track of where that football field is supposed to be and where it actually is in real time and then referencing. So the computer is constantly checking with the satellite, checking with the visual images on the ground. And this is back in 1985. And uh, we were on the ground, we had infrared tags, and then the um, radio operator would, would let uh, the targeting engineer know that there was, uh, say, 11 friendly targets on the ground. Uh, plus one, uh, one piece of equipment, so 12 friendly targets, you know, 11 humans and one piece of equipment, and those need to be not fired upon. And so that's what the infrared, so the infrared tag's not a shield and it's not a guarantee, but uh, then the uh, targeting engineer would look on the screen and see, well, I only, I only see 10 targets. You've got, you've got 12 friendly, so um, when to, can you, I, I see a column, there's one on the left, can you have uh, the, the one furthest north move east two feet? And as they're flying over, they would see that that uh, infrared marker would move or not move. Uh, the third person in the line, can you move to your right or can you move to your left? Okay, I see you, great. Um, but, and you know, so then you've got your targeting engineer. Okay, now I see, okay, there it is. All right, now I see 12. I have 12 targets confirmed and I would identify approximately the latitude and longitude of the friendly targets. And then once uh, it was confirmed, the 12 friendly targets, there uh, would be a fail-safe firing mechanism clear, and then they initiate the firing sequence. And what would happen is the, the Vulcan uh, gun would fire 20 millimeter rounds, <laughs> this big around, 20 millimeter cartridges, and they were belt-fed dual, dual well, multi-barrel, I don't remember, five or six barrels each. Anyway, uh, but when they fire, push the fire button, the computer would initiate and it would fire a bullet and drop a 20 millimeter round every square six inches on that football field, except for within a foot of the outside of each of those 12 friendly targets. So at that moment, when their fire engineer uh, was firing, everyone would freeze, you would just, Hold still, they push the button and you'd hear and then that fast, this machine gun, flying machine gun, computer controlled, using not artificial intelligence, but computer intelligence of the 1980s, would drop a 20 millimeter round every square six inches. Six inches away, a bullet would hit the ground. And 12 inches outside of the perimeter of every friendly human is where the rounds would land. So literally, if you were in a very heavily forested area, after the burp, every tree would be shredded. And the only tree standing, the only thing standing, would be those 12 friendly targets that were identified. Now that's computer intelligence or uh, machine intelligence, not artificial intelligence because it's not smart enough to simulate humans. The key difference between machine intelligence and artificial intelligence is, is really that you're attempting to simulate living thought. And the closest thing we get to that is with probabilistic algorithms. And 
It's literally using math to predict the future. And um, with that example of the puff, it's simply identifying without any probabilistic algorithms um, the friendly targets and excluding that from the target area. That's all. It's just basically removing that from the target area. It's pretty simple. But when you're dealing with probabilistic algorithms, you're going to add in things like letting the computer determine what is a friendly target or not. And that's the scary thing when you take the human out of the loop because in, in our case, in the 80s, the, um, the aircraft would communicate with the troops on the ground to confirm. I've only got 10. Well, there's only 10, but there's 12 of us. There's 11 humans and one friendly piece of equipment. We can't have any of those. There's no margin for error. You can't fail. I mean, you've got, it's, in the military, there's a term called the go or no-go. It's basically pass-fail. And so you don't get a 99%. It has to be 100%. And uh, machines just can't quite do that. You know, you've heard about the Tesla crash recently. Uh, the, the challenge with uh, self-driving vehicles is they don't have the ability to uh, get the eye contact. You know, if you're driving along, you can look over and see a bicyclist. And the way the cyclist and the driver knows that they know each other is just that eyeball, eyeball to eyeball contact. And there's just no way to simulate that yet. And, and they're working on it. So if you want to learn more about probabilistic algorithms, you'll want to read a book called Probabilistic Algorithms by Dieter Fox. And uh, he's an instructor over at the University of Washington. And um, you can take courses from him uh, and, you know, read his book. Great to talk to. Very intelligent man. Knows a lot about this. And, and we use the probabilistic algorithms in, in building robots that estimate human behavior. And uh, to give you an idea how we would use the probabilistic algorithms, uh, just going back to an example where I was uh, invited to speak and, um, in Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, at the University of Michigan, and I uh, spoke at a conference. I brought one of the uh, life suit robotic exoskeletons out there to demonstrate and uh, interact with doctors and nurses. And while I was there, I got to visit the sleep lab. And you got to think outside the box. I mean, why would a, a guy involved with building robotic exoskeletons that are designed to help paralyzed people learn to walk again, why would you be interested in, in going to a sleep lab? Well, I had read a paper and found out that at this university, that for 10 years, over 10 years, they had been collecting data. Data is, data is, it's like treasure. It's like buried treasure because it was, you know, they were using it for other things, but what I wanted to use the data for, and they, they gave us permission to access the data, was uh, for uh, probabilistic algorithms. For, um, for me, I was just using it for control systems, but it, it could actually be used for artificial intelligence, and this is a little scary. But I'll tell you the way that, that we, the way it was collected was uh, people would go in, they'd have uh, seizure problems, and they would go into the lab to have a study done to see when, what causes seizures to trigger. Because a lot of people would have uh, seizures that would trigger when the, the television flashes, or there's some kind of, you know, the lights change, or some people uh, are sensitive to certain foods, that sort of thing. And so what they would do is they, they built this mock-up apartment in the hospital, and it had a living room area, television, a kitchenette, bathroom, and uh, um, an area to watch television. And uh, the, the people would just live their life for a day, usually 24 hours. Uh, sometimes uh, it would be for several days. And they asked, while you're here, do you mind if we collect data for other research? And they most people signed off. Yeah. So they have 10 years of sleep uh, study research. And when, what they do is they hook up electrodes to your brain. I think it's 14 or 15 electrodes. All these wires coming off. And uh, what they showed me when I got to see the data is, is they play back the video of the person sitting there on the couch watching television. And the brainwave patterns, uh, you have 14 different brainwaves. And you can see the, on the chart this, the brainwaves moving and, and different things. And right before the person uh, moves, you'll see a spike on the brain on the patterns. And later we would show the video to the patient and ask them, what were you thinking at this moment? Like, oh, well, that's the moment I was thinking of changing the channel. So right before they moved, you saw a spike in brain activity. As they reached for the remote, there was different spikes. As they actually pushed with their thumb on the channel up button, you'd see different spikes. If they were looking down and pushing five, 
three, you could actually see and identify. If you overlaid and you had uh, six people that were thinking of pushing the number five, that even though they were off by about 10 points, there was what's called a best fit line. And if you took those 10 different, best, uh, 10 different brain patterns and overlaid them, you would see a best fit line that averages within 10 points up and down on the chart. And so you decide that this is the range for anticipation. And so you could actually interview them. What were you thinking right before you moved? And they, most of the women were saying, I was thinking about changing the channel to the news. And if, if they were changing the channel to the news, they would overlay that. So you have 10 or 15, 20 people that were thinking about anticipation of changing the channel to the news, and their spikes were different and, and similar enough that you could overlay them. It's called the best fit lines, where you average that, the, the lines on that chart. And then for people that were anticipating, thinking about changing the channel to sports, their brain patterns were different. Someone who's thinking about changing the channel to a movie or to soap operas or game shows were different. And the difference was so profound that if you overlaid that with someone who was thinking about changing to a movie, it was consistent. So all the moviegoers, all the sports, all the news, if you overlaid those, it was, it was similar enough that you come up with what's a best fit line. And then what you do with that is you say anyone who has a brain pattern within these 10 points on this chart, then that anticipation is they want to change to a movie. So in an actual playback, if someone's thinking about reaching for the remote, now you hook up this computer um, uh, sensing device, a human computer interface, brain computer interface, BCI, H HIT, human interface technology. There's all different terms for it. But basically, you hook up the computer. The paralyzed person's thinking about reaching for the remote to change the channel to a movie. And in anticipation, the robot changes the channel to a movie. Thinking about the news, it changes the news for you. It anticipates. It's called probabilistic algorithms. So you take that best fit line, you measure, and if it's within that, and then the way we use that in the robotics lab, and this has not been approved yet, but we've been proven that it works, it's just not approved yet. And that's what we're working on, is get this, get this approved for paralyzed people so they can use this. Now they can think about standing up from the chair, and that best fit line knows, recognizes that I, this person wants to stand up, so the robot suit stands up. They think about taking a step forward. And because the best fit line is in that, within that 10 points on the chart, then the robot takes a step. And so with this probabilistic algorithms, with the brain sensing technology, you can actually walk at the speed of thought. And so if you develop a robotic, that's a robotic system that's sensitive enough, then it can, uh, it can sense the, the uh, desires of the user. And that's the goal with the life suit is eventually that a paralyzed person wouldn't need to be able to push on a joystick. They simply think about it. And there's some research that you can read about. Uh, the, the studies are out. It's called BrainGate. It was back in, I think, 2005, BrainGate Technology, where they actually did surgery. Uh, started out with some monkeys, and the monkeys would play a video game, and um, they would s notice the thoughts. And then they took the... Uh, and the video game was they use a joystick to move a dot on the screen, and if the dot got into the box, then it would drop a food pallet. Monkey grabbed the food. Yum, yum, yum. And then they got the, the monkey to move the joystick and watch this. Then once they get the dot into the box, and they would move the box around. So the monkey had to move the dot in different places on the screen. Then they took the joysticks away. And the monkey had to just think about it. And they would move that dot. And when that dot got into the box, a food pellet would drop. And then the box would move. And then the monkey would think about it. And the dot would move, get in the box, food pellet would come. And because of that, they were able to prove that they could do it with monkeys. That got them approval for the human subjects. And they had a patient who was paralyzed, quadriplegic. They cut open his brain. They put a chip right on the gray matter of his brain. And with that, they were able to sense his thoughts. And um, they were able to have him sit in a wheelchair and think about moving forward and think about turning left and right. And with the brain gate technology, they were able to prove that it was possible. Now, we were able to implement some of the technology from Europe where they didn't actually have to cut open the brain and stick the, the electrodes right on the gray matter. Um, you can actually have to shave the head. We haven't quite gotten around that yet. Uh, you shave the head, you put a sensor on, and then there's a magnetic field. Later, we found you don't even have to shave. 
if you have a sensitive enough magnet, because everywhere there's uh, electrical current, there's a magnetic field that's perpendicular. It's uh, Faraday's law, Michael Faraday. That's another story, I'm not even going to go into that. But basically, because the brain is an electric machine, every thought has a magnetic field, has a magnetic pulse. And you can put coils and pick up all of those thoughts through what I call the lobe node. And it uh, pretty much looks like an, a Bluetooth, one of those old Bluetooth headsets that people used to wear um, all, all the time. And so we could even put a blue light on it so everyone would think you're just talking on an old technology cell phone. Uh, but a paralyzed person could walk around with a life suit that the, the power systems are so small that it fits underneath their clothes. It looks very much like a wet suit. You zip it on and it's uh, controlled by, by thought. And that's uh, machine intelligence. And uh, we use probabilistic algorithms. We don't have any need for artificial intelligence. But the idea is to advance machine intelligence with the math so that it simulates uh, into, um, artificial intelligence. You know, and there's uh... so that's the benefit. You know, there's horror stories. We've all seen Terminator and the, the fear of the machines taking over. And and uh, the, you know, the biggest uh, moral dilemma is the machines want to protect humans. And the best way to protect humans is to eliminate them because humans are the greatest threat to humans. So that's the problem. That's, that's the biggest problem, biggest challenge to uh, unleashing artificial intelligence is that if you give the artificial intelligence the command to protect the humans, it may actually destroy us. So I um, hope that helps you to understand a little bit about uh, machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, and probabilistic robotics and how it applies to the life suit. So the uh, life suit is a, a research project uh, being overseen by theyshallwalk.org. It's the website, and uh, the life suit exoskeleton designs. Uh, most of the designs are in the public domain. We encourage people to go ahead and experiment, develop, build exoskeletons. Uh, there are companies that are manufacturing them now. They're uh, approved by the uh, FDA of uh, of the U.S. And, and other countries. And so, if you are paralyzed and you want to learn to walk again, just tell your physical therapist. Tell them you want to get in one of the studies. Uh, there are over 300 people now that are using these type of powered exoskeletons at home instead of wheelchairs. So you have the ability to walk now. And I just want to take this moment to thank all of our supporters, all of our donors that have helped us uh, do millions of dollars in research over several decades. I want to thank all of the high school, elementary school, high school and college students that have been involved, all the uh, teachers, all the professors, all the parents of the interns. Uh, all of the college students that have put in their time and efforts uh, to help us to give the gift of walking to the world. And uh, we have a, a passion to uh, build a new research facility. And uh, we need $200 million for the equipment, for the facility, for the location. Before we break ground, we need, uh, need some cash to come in. So we don't have an official fundraising uh, program going on, but you can make a donation to theyshallwalk.org. You can uh, donate online through PayPal. You can make a, a donation uh, also by check. Uh, you can drop one in the mail. Of course, most people are doing it online. So you can just uh, go to theyshallwalk.org or uh, the They Shall Walk Facebook page and make a donation there. Uh, we have uh, programs for specific people that are trying to get $150,000 so they can have one of these machines at home. And uh, this is the uh, older machine that uses a joystick. The new one that will go by the power of thought. That's what we're working on now. And uh, we'd like to see that in the next few years. And uh, the technology exists, and we can do it with your help. So we want to thank you all for your support. My name is Monty Reed for They Shall Walk. Have a great day. Keep thriving, my friends.